So, what about Brexit? Well, today the government published its repeal bill, the legislation that will transfer EU law onto the British statute book. A huge and complex undertaking. Theresa May called it Brexit's biggest day yet. This is also the day that marks the Prime Minister's first year in office, but how much longer will she stay in the job? The election was a disaster for the Conservative leader. Regrets? She has a few. Well, I felt, um, I suppose, devastated, really, because, I, as I say, I knew the campaign wasn't going perfectly, but still the messages I was getting um, from people I was speaking to, but also the comments we were getting back from a lot of people that, that were being passed on to me, were that we were going to get a better result than we did. Devastated enough to shed a tear? Um, to, uh, yes, a little tear. Yes. At yes. that moment, that at that moment. At that moment, yes. So what does Nigel Farage think of this softer Theresa May? Whatever your politics, however you feel about Nigel Farage, Nigel Farage had an idea and he had a lot of personality. Jeremy Corbyn had a lot of personality. The big criticism of Theresa May is she was a bit robotic. A bit? Look, she's a nothing. She doesn't even exist. I mean, she stands up and gives these speeches. Uh, she's humourless. Robotic, as you've said, uh, lacks sincerity completely. And I, for me, the one thing that sums her up is after that disastrous fire at the Grenfell Tower. And she turns up as Prime Minister, shakes the hand of the police chief, shakes the hand of the fire chief and disappears. Doesn't even meet the families that have been affected by it. I mean, goodness me, the King and Queen during the war went to the east end of London to visit people who had been bombed but overnight. But so she lacks, the, she lacks the human touch. She's too buttoned up. And she also, I think, comes across to me as the ultimate career politician. She will go whichever way public opinion takes her. Does that worry you when it comes to Brexit? Because this is a tough enough ask anyway, and you have to carry the It does worry with you. me, yes, because I mean, she was asked in that general election time and again, did she as a Remainer now believe in Brexit? And all she could say was, we'll carry out the will of the people. Look, I think that over the course of the next few months, uh, it'll become clear that she's not really commanding the support of her own party, you know, either wing of her party. I think she'll be gone in a few months. And I think the Conservative Party absolutely have to have a leader that believes in Brexit. Even if she's gone, it's looking increasingly possible, at least, that it's going to be a softer Brexit than you might have liked. Um, a year ago, would you have thought this was possible? No, I thought we were a democratic country. I thought the political class would, for once, just have to accept that they couldn't have things their own way. Because it's funny, because see, what's actually happened is public but maybe opinion... maybe the country does want a soft Brexit. Well, that's, this is what's interesting, though. Public opinion now, you know, consistently, about 70% of people say, however we voted a year ago, we want the government simply to get on with it. And that includes, by the way, leaving the single market. It's the political class in the House of Commons and the House of Lords that are trying to rally against it. Brexit will happen. Of that, I've got absolutely no doubt at all. But I do agree uh, with the basis of the question. I think there will be areas where we concede more than we need but to. Just, just a quick one. Um, you said it's democratic. The democratic numbers in the House say it's going to be a softer Brexit. That is democracy. Uh, the parliamentary numbers worry me very greatly. And yes, look, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think we're going to get a much softer Brexit than the people voted for, uh, which means we're going to be debating this for the next two or three general elections. Oh, no. I'm afraid <laughs> of it, so... <laughs> As a savouring thought. To look after working communities in this country, and it's given all of that up in favour of an open door to southern and eastern Europe. But isn't that racist? I don't think it is, no. I don't think it is. I, I don't think it can be deemed as such in any way. I mean, we've never in our history had a complete open door, and now we have one to 485 million people. I don't think, in terms of common sense, that really adds up. But. If you are a racist, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it means that you are have or showing the belief that a particular race is superior to another. And presumably, if you're saying that British people uh, should have jobs above East Europeans, you're suggesting that they're superior. And as a result, wow. that's racist. <coughs> Well, actually, this is a big argument in London amongst the Afro-Caribbean community, 50% of whom's youngsters haven't got jobs. And that same survey that was done recently showed over 60% of the settled ethnic minorities in this country also believe we've got to have some degree of control. So this crosses all boundaries within this country. OK, but you're getting bogged down in the figures again. And as I said, remember what happened to Mr Clegg when he did that? Yeah. 
I've given you the definition of racist. Well, yeah. You told me what you thought about the fact that British workers uh, should uh, have a superior chance of getting a job above European workers, whether they're from Eastern Europe or whatever. And that is quite simply a racist comment. No, it isn't. It is the job of a British government, firstly, to defend the realm, and secondly, to put the interests of the people that live in this country first. That's what we should be doing, and I'm afraid we've turned our backs on that over the course of the last few years, uh, which has led to much, much unhappiness among millions of families. What should happen to East Europeans who are working here at the moment? Uh, well, there are many, of course, uh, that have come here and done incredibly well. Uh, there are others that have come here and haven't done incredibly well. What is for certain is that if you have an oversupply in the labour market, particularly the unskilled labour market, you force down wages and you make it much harder, particularly for school leavers. You didn't frankly have the balls to put country before party. I'm going next to Sadiq, who's calling from Ilford. Good evening, Sadiq. Good evening, Nigel. Nigel, uh, just a few minutes ago, yep. um, and, and nothing new for you, to be honest, perfectly honest, is you told an absolute blatant whopper. Oh, gosh. Um, oh, God, I'm looking forward to this. Right, what did I do? Yeah. You said Saudi Arabia have taken not a single refugee from Syria, um, or, and the Gulf states haven't. And, and when, they, when, in fact, just a cursory bit of research yep. will tell you that they've taken over two million from where? refugees um, from Syria um, uh, around there. And, and when? the fact is that they don't call them refugees, Nigel. Right. They call them uh, uh, citizens. Um, in Saudi Arabia, so to, to not, not make them feel inferior. So, and you know that for, for, for a fact, Nigel, um, whatever, but you keep telling these whopping lies because your audience laps it up. So, so it really, you know really is utterly fascinating yeah, yeah. because you're, and, you and, are... And it's just like your bus, it's just like your, um, uh, you know, your queue um, getting into the country during the referendum yeah, that you used. Absolutely. You used all, all those brown faces and whatever, have you? So, you know, Nigel... Well, what should, what, so agenda, so what should I have done? Your audience will lap it up. What should I have done? Should I have, should I have pretended that wasn't happening? Should I have ignored it? I mean, what I was talking well, well, about... We'll address the lie first, Nigel. Well, address well, the well, lie well, first. Sadiq, I'm... The I'm lie first. I, I, I am not aware. Just a cursory, just a cursory, just a cursory. They cursory have not bit taken. Research, they have not just taken. A cursory, I know, just and you'd and you'd find out, Sadiq, that actually yeah. the Saudi Arabian the Saudi Arabian regime have said we are not taking any refugees taken, from Nigel, Syria. They don't call them refugees. That's the difference, Nigel. And the same goes. If, if the same goes them, for half. Nigel, address and the same the goes. Lie, Nigel, Nigel address no, no the lie, lie at all. They've taken not a single refugee. And and they back that, and that. back to your point. Well, to the audience, that, please go and do. Your that, research because that, Nigel is lying once more. Oh, I've been saying once this now. I've lying. been saying this for a long, long time, and I think I'm right and you're wrong, but it's been great fun, Sadiq. And let me just answer the last point you made. Do you know that poster showing the madness that was happening in Europe as a result of the failed policies of Juncker and but, Merkel is exactly is exactly is exactly brown faces, Nigel. Well, well, I could have whitened them out, couldn't faces. I? So are you suggesting yeah. that I change the colour of people's faces? Is that really what you're suggesting? Well, N Nigel, you see what it is. You don't is like the truth, do you? You don't like the Sorry? truth. You don't like the truth, do you? The really, fact Nigel, is, you're the fact so, is, so your so your lie about is, Saudi Arabia, so your lie about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf so, States. So, so tell me, what is your source for this? You, what is your source for this? Sorry. What is your source Nigel, for this? Just do just do just do a cursory research on, I, on well, research. And the Saudi I Arabian think, Sadiq, I think Saudi Arabian ambassador. I think himself. Made this the is. I think this is yeah. fake. I think this is fake news, Sadiq. But really? it's been, Nigel, but it's been Nigel, fun. Nigel, your middle name is fake. You know, your middle name oh, is fake. Well, I well, I tell you what. <laughs> I've been getting away with it for a long time then, haven't I? I, can't, I must be quite good at it, really, mustn't I? Sadiq, thank you for that charming, fascinating, factual call. Uh, the Saudi Arabian Independent in September 2016 said that Saudi Arabia has issued residency permits for 100,000 Syrians, though it has not formally accepted anyone actually classed as a refugee. So... So, uh, to begin with, Sadiq, I don't know where you got your figure of two million from. I mean, that was fake news. But the important thing is, clearly, they've taken 100,000 middle-class people who've got lots of money, who've gone in to Saudi Arabia, are able to buy properties, etc. They haven't taken anyone poor. They haven't taken anyone that's cold or is suffering. I asked Mehdi in Tower Hamlets whether the Swedish Prime Minister has got this right and whether this U-turn is sincere. Hi, Nigel. I think Swedish Prime Minister got it absolutely wrong. Yeah. Purely because this is what the terrorists want. And just like terrorists, this is what people like you, who 
do part of racism in, in the society want to solve. Do I? You support? Yes, you do. You support a nasty Marine Le Pen. You think she's do nasty? Do I? I've been neutral. I've been absolutely neutral on the subject. You, you, you do. You do support her. Do I? Well, why? Well, why? Well. This is interesting, isn't it? So I don't sit with the Front National in the European Parliament. I haven't for the last 18 years. I know Marine Le Pen, because we're both MEPs in the same Parliament, but I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not an overt public supporter of hers. Not that I'm aware of, Mehdi. I mean, you're, you're telling me things I don't know. Well, he did, he did say on this radio station about Marine Le Pen, it would be fantastic that she, she win in, in France. I didn't say that, but I did say you'd be. A, I did say you'd be a fool if you said she couldn't win in France, and that I did say, and I have said, uh, maybe to be fair, I have said that she's a marked improvement upon her father, and she's taken the party in a much more satisfactory she's still direction. She's a racist, Nigel. Is she she's still a racist? Why is she a racist? Is a racist party. What? What? what tell me, me. Explain to me. Explain to me. Explain to the, all the people listening. Why is she a racist? Explain it to us. Why do you think she is? Does she, does she hate Muslims? No, actually, if you listen, I interviewed her for this show, and it was played a couple of weeks ago, and I was very specific, very, very, very specific, and go to lbc.co.uk, and you can see that interview, you can listen to that interview, Mehdi, or anybody else that's interested. I asked her very much about this, and there is a, I mean, there is a prominent politician in Europe, in the form of Gert Wilders, in the Netherlands, who wants to go to war against the entire religion of Islam. He wants the mosques bulldozed, he wants the Koran banned in the Netherlands, and he wants the religion to be outlawed. Um, and, and I have to say, Media, I find that unacceptable and crazy, and, and, and a plan that will never work. That is not what Marine Le Pen is saying, and I really don't see how this charge, I mean, her father, you could make the charge, is racist, he said some things that clearly overtly are. I do, honestly don't think you've given me one reason to think that Marine Le Pen is racist. Well, is she not? Is she against Borka? Does she think that Quran is a barbaric? Does she think that? Uh, well, I, I, I mean, she's, she, she has not opined heavily on it, but she's worried about some of the latter parts of the Quran, aren't you? No, I'm not. I'm not. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because if you look at the Muslims, I'm a Muslim myself, right? Mm -hmm. A tiny minority, a tiny, tiny minority of Muslims are doing what they're doing. You're labeling them as a Muslim terrorist because what you really want people to believe that Islam is at fault. But whereas, if they're terrorists, they're not, they don't belong to a religion, Nigel. Well, they, the, the, called, the trouble with this argument, the trouble with this argument, Mehdi, the trouble with this argument is this that there are lots of people like you who say, not in my name, you know, this is not what the religion of Islam is all about. The trouble is the people who are doing the awful things believe themselves that they are doing it in the name of Islam. And I agree with you. It may be a tiny percentage, but goodness me, look at the problems that it's causing, you know, right across Europe. I mean, we've almost got to the point, Mehdi, where a terrorist atrocity is just a sort of everyday part of life that we hear on the news from somewhere in Europe, and we almost expect it to happen. But it's not terrorism. It's not the religion, though. It is nothing to do with religion. Have you ever called an IRA Christian terrorist? Have you, have you condemned what's going on in, in Burma? Have you ever condemned? Yes, I think it's absolutely dreadful, and I'm very, very surprised that Aung, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi doesn't say more about it. Mehdi, I'm sorry, I know you want to have a real punch-up with me over this, and, and you want to call me racist and Le Pen racist, and, 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 and you want to accuse us of wanting to wipe out uh, the faith. We don't, but we do want to get tough with the terrorists, and we do want deeper integration, but I thank you for your call. Sixty-seven percent uh, want a ban on the burqa, but the immigration minister, who happens to be here tonight, says it would be un-British. Who is right? Well, um, you, you've been talking a lot, Damien Green, so I'm tempted not to go to you first. Um, but but um, I, I, I won't. I'll come, I'll come to you in a moment. Nigel Farage, who's right? The sixty-seven percent of the British who say they want the burqa banned, or? Damien Green, who says it's un-British to do that. Well, Damien Green says that, but Caroline Spellman, who also speaks for the government, says that the burqa is empowering. Now, I find this concept absolutely extraordinary. The idea that a woman being covered up is somehow empowered 
uh, when it seems to me that her chances of being fully a part of society, her chances of getting a job have been severely diminished, uh, shows me that this government has frankly lost its courage. It doesn't want to discuss this issue because, you know, the French have discussed this issue in their parliament. The Belgians, odd country that it is, have discussed this issue in their parliament. Uh, the Spanish are about to, the Italians are going to, the Syrians this week have decided to ban the burqa on university campuses. It is banned in Turkey. So right across the, 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 the Middle East and the Western world, there is a very serious debate about the burqa. I, I think that this is yet another issue where this coalition government, and I'm afraid the Labour Party too, show themselves to be completely out of touch with the vast majority of British people. And what people are saying is, look, we have been the most tolerant country in Europe. We have, we have been the haven for people who have been fleeing oppression. We've given asylum to people. We, are, we want to be a tolerant society, but we don't want to live in a divided society. And I think the point about the covering of the face is we see this as a symbol of an increasingly divided and ghettoised Britain, and we don't want it. We want to live together, regardless of race, religion or class. We want to rub along together and operate in the same society, and we see the burqa being worn, you know, whether it's on public transport or in a bank or in an area where we couldn't cover our face, we see this as being a so barrier. So what's your policy? Where would, you, where would you keep ban, ban the burqa? I... I, David, I don't think... I don't think it's desirable to tell people what they should wear walking down the high street in Hartlepool. But you just have. How, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. What I've said is, what I've said is that if I can't walk into, into you know, the local bank in Hartlepool wearing a balaclava, then somebody should not go in there with their face covered wearing a burqa. <laughs> That's all I've said. Well, uh, and I think... Actually, it's... Actually, um, that, you, you, you didn't say that. It's the first time you've said that. But what you... No, you, 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 you changed well, no, our policy this no, week. No, never but, changed our... But we've no. always said... We've always said we want equality in this country. We can't have a group of people being given preferential treatment. And it is a symbol so where you of can't division wear the, in society. So where you can't wear the balaclava... Yes. The, the balaclava test, really, is what you'd or, or, Well, it could be the motorcycle helmet, David. Or the motorcycle helmet, but, right. but, 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 yeah. Said it can. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we should legislate on what people wear... I think it's patronising for us to tell people what to wear or what not to wear. I think it's ironic that we want to empower these women by criminalising it. We want to emancipate them by sending them to prison. And as objectionable as some of you may find, and as oppressive as you might find, that in some countries you've got to be forced to cover up, I think people will find it equally oppressive and unpalatable that we force them not to cover up. Uh, Nigel, and what was wonderful about our country is not just the tolerance, but the respect we have for each other, not just differences of opinion, differences of culture, differences of dress. And if it's the case that the mischief is a woman wearing a niqab or a man wearing a balaclava in a bank, then in that particular circumstance you can ask them to take it off, for example, in the airports, as they do. But to then make that into a bigger argument about they shouldn't wear it on the streets... I haven't said that. ..it's leading to division. You use the word that. division. I haven't said that. You use the word preferential treatment. I think that's just disingenuous. Well, I haven't Nigel. said it. I haven't and said it to me. So... <laughs> I, I, I haven't said that. Sorry, but I haven't said that. The French have, but I haven't well, said that. Well, French... as, as a Muslim yourself, do you have any view about whether Muslim women should or shouldn't wear the veil? No, I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm quite relaxed about it. I think as a man, I don't like the idea of me telling women what, what to wear. The idea, I would say, at my advice surgery, because your miniskirt is too short, I'm not seeing you. Because your nose is pierced, I find you objectionable. Or because you're wearing a niqab, I will not see you. This is completely different, Sadiq, isn't it? It's just patronising people. This is people. Well, it's it's well, covering their face. You know, and the so point what, what is, is covering their, their face and, the point, and they're ruining their life chances, Nigel, aren't they? Well, well, listen, if you're concerned... Do you want equality or not? Nigel, if you're concerned about the life chances of British women and Muslim faith, why don't you make sure they do better at schools by investing more in our schools rather than closing... Well, you had 13 years to do that and you clearly failed to do so. I right. want to encourage more to go to university. The man the strikes too, Yes, you yes, sir. Up there at the back. Yes. Yeah, the balaclava question is hypothetical, but I have to remove my, my full face crash helmet if I go into Tesco's to buy petrol. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. um, uh, and, and you, sir. Uh, okay, Damien Green, I'll come to you. Uh, what would be the, the BBC's viewpoint? When we signed in today, we had to show a visual photo idea of ourselves, which wouldn't have happened with somebody in a burqa, presumably. 
I, I don't know what yeah, um, people 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 do people do wear the burqa in 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 question time. We've had so, so what happens when they sign in? I, I imagine they show their faces. That doesn't get any big issue. <laughs> Damien Green. And, and nor is it when you come through immigration Absolutely. control. Of course you've got to show your face to show that your face is the face of the person on your passport. So the whole security issue, which Nigel tries to raise, is a complete red herring. It's nothing to do with this debate. And I'll tell you why I said I thought a ban on the burqa was un-British. Because I think one of the best British traditions is live and let live. Have mutual tolerance and respect for each other. And the idea that politicians should pass a law telling women what they can and can't wear is profoundly un-British. It's a big step towards a police state. How can it be un-British if 67% of people well, in one of, say in one they opinion want to poll, In one opinion poll. Well, um, I think, I think we, 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 we had 13 years uh, of a government that would take one opinion poll and say, right, we're going to change policy now. And very often that's when uh, the previous government, not, you know, not all it did was bad, but that was when it was at its worst. Okay. But apart from that, think of the practical implications. That we would be sending the police out on the high streets of Britain to arrest young women for what they were wearing. Do you want to see that? And if they refuse to take it off, presumably they'd be fined, they'd be taken to court. If they refuse to pay the fines, we'd be jailing them. First of all, that would be the most tremendous waste of police time and court time and taxpayers' money. And secondly, I can't think of a single way of increasing divisions in our society than that the majority in society should say to one particular minority, indeed a minority of the Muslim, the two million Muslims in this country, to say, you alone are going to be banned from wearing an item of clothing that you want to wear, and we're going to make you criminals for wearing it. It would be really, really stupid. Is it, um